subscribe, stay up to date. Episodes drop every other Monday. Welcome to the Matt Watch That Podcast, the place for reviews, rants, and randomness. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to watch a movie or TV pilot that I probably should have seen but never got around to. It could be a recent favorite, critic's choice, or cult classic. To join in on the conversation, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed, or suggestions as to what I should see next, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Before we start, I wanted to talk about the Beatles. Now I know on this podcast I've shared some opinions that might be considered divisive, but I guarantee this is my most controversial. <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of the Beatles. All right, I'll, I'll give you a couple moments to process that. Here's why. I think partially it has to do with overexposure. At every family function, the Beatles would be playing. Birthday parties, the Beatles. Summer pool party, the Beatles. Thanksgiving, the Beatles. I just needed a little break. I mean, can we spread the love a little bit? Give some other bands a chance? There are some good ones out there. I can name 76 off the top of my head. But no, Beatles. Beatles, Beatles, Beatles. So I know I got sick of hearing oh blah dee, oh blah da. But life does go on. It also has to do with the fact that the music that I started listening to, the music that I grew up with, was so much heavier than the Beatles. Whether it was Queen, Led Zeppelin, even bands like the Go-Go's and the Bangles rocked harder than the Beatles. They just did. So when I'd hear their songs, even the later ones that were more experimental, it just felt like pop to me. It, it, it didn't have that aggressiveness that I needed. But that's not to take away from their influence. I 100% understand that. I get their historical significance. The United States, we were in a rut. John F. Kennedy, our hope for a brighter future, got his head blown off. It was a dark time. And then these four lads cross the pond, appear on Ed Sullivan with their hippy-dippy doofy tunes, and it made everyone happy. It's wonderful. And I appreciate that they have influenced every band that I've listened to. Nirvana. If you take off Distortion, those are Beatles songs. Even the aforementioned Bangles. Their harmonies are straight out of the Beatles' playbook. Their name was even a spin-off of the Beatles. They were originally called the Bangs, but there happened to be another band called that, so they just added L-E-S at the end of the name and became the Bangles. Now, I don't like using this word. I think it's harsh. But the Beatles did write a song that I absolutely hate. Hate! And that's Hey Jude. I cannot stand that song. And the four and a half minutes of na 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 nas makes me want to go bye 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 bye. But before I get hate tweets, I will give the Beatles their due. They also wrote one of my favorite songs, Let It Be. That is pure perfection. I also like in my life, Eleanor Rigby, Nowhere Man. As usual, I tend to gear towards the ballads. But they also have a song like Revolution Number no. 9, which I know is not everyone's cup of tea, but that's the sound that I like. That song actually rocks. I do wish I liked the Beatles more. I'm already dreading the next family get-together. But I'll give it to them. They, they were good. Yeah, they, they had some talent. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is Skip It. Two stars Watch at Your Own Risk. 3 stars standard fare, 4 stars worth checking out, and 5 stars must see. Now if I give a title 5 stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. On this episode of the podcast, I'll be reviewing A Hard Day's Night from 1964. So how'd I miss it? 
I've already mentioned that while I like the Beatles, they aren't my favorite. So I never went out of my way to watch any of their movies, though I did watch the Peter Jackson documentary on Disney Plus and found it really fascinating. It was directed by Richard Lester, who helmed Help, The Three Musketeers, Superman 2, and Superman 3. The screenplay was written by Alan Owen, who scribed The Concrete Jungle, episodes of Armchair Theater, Corrigan Blake and Forget Me Not, and earned an Oscar nomination for Best Writing, Story and Screenplay, written directly for the screen, for this movie. It stars John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr, collectively known as The Beatles. This would be the first of five films featuring the Fab Four, with Help in 1965, Magical Mystery Tour in 1967, Yellow Submarine in 1968, and Let It Be in 1970. This is something to look out for. During the opening scene, George falling onto the ground was unscripted, but after he got up and continued running, the director decided to keep it in the movie. So let's jump into it. A Hard Day's Night starts with John, Paul, George, and Ringo being chased by a group of rabid fans, taking shelter in telephone call boxes and photo booths, using disguises, before escaping into a departing train. The Fab Four squeeze into a roomette compartment with an older gentleman that Paul introduces as his grandfather. Their road manager, Shake, and band manager, Norm, check in with the group and make sure that they're ready for tomorrow's performance in the television theater. In the middle of playing cards, they break into I Should Have Known Better, and instruments magically appear for them to play. They arrive at the train station and are rushed into cars that drive off before the throngs of fans could catch them. At the hotel, Shake and Norm bring their fan mail, with Ringo receiving the most, along with an invite to Le Cirque Club. Norm instructs them to answer all the letters, but they ignore his request and go out partying, but are soon brought back to the hotel to discover that Paul's grandfather has taken the invitation. The Beatles need to rescue the old man from the gambling club, and then get ready for their television performance. Here's a quote without context. I'm going out parading before it's too late. A Hard Day's Night is prototypical British fare. Mugging for the camera, play on words, deadpan humor, which couldn't have been more apparent in a scene where a man is hiding in their hotel closet. Instead of being shocked or surprised, Ringo and George have no reaction. That's the British sensibility. Stiff upper lip. John seemed to be having the most fun. He's a bit of a scamp throughout. Ringo plays a more innocent character. But the plot is paper thin, as you can tell from my summary. It's a vehicle for the band and their catchy tunes. You'll get to hear a good amount of the album performed in part or full. Look, this isn't my cup of tea, but I have to give it the proper context, and in my opinion, it's comparable to Spice World, another movie about British sensations, and I will fully admit to seeing that film in theaters. My friends and I took a bus. Yes, public transportation to get there. So I understand a small percentage of the fandom, and that's who this movie is geared towards. But ultimately, the movie comes down to watching four guys running around, acting a fool for 90 minutes. There are worse ways to spend your time. Now for a little trivial trivia. Screenwriter Alan Owen went on tour with the Beatles to experience their newfound fame and cultural impact. A Hard Day's Night was produced by Walter Shenson. The cinematography was captured by Gilbert Taylor, whose filmography includes Frenzy, The Omen, Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope, and Dracula. It was edited by John Gypsum, who worked on Frenzy, Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope, Little Shop of Horrors, A Fish Called Wanda, and in and out The score was composed by George Martin, who wrote the music for Live and Let Die, The Optimists, and Honky Tonk Freeway. It was nominated for a Best Music, Scoring of Music, Adaptation of Treatment Oscar, but the Beatles weren't nominated for any of their songs. The soundtrack obviously features songs by the Beatles, including A Hard Day's Night, All My Loving, Can't Buy Me Love, and She Loves You. The runtime is 1 hour 27 minutes. It had a budget of $250,000 and grossed $11 million at the box office. I think. Those could be in pounds. It was nominated for two Oscars at the 1965 Academy Awards. I give it almost four stars. Again, putting it in context. Take off a star if you don't get British humor. Add a star if you're a fan of the Fab Four. If you've seen A Hard Day's Night and have opinions on the movie, let me know what you think using the hashtag MattWatchThat. Moving right along. 
Each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there will be a playlist called Matt Watch That Playback. As frequent listeners of this podcast will know, I'm a fan of the British things. Not everything. Costume dramas are not my thing. That old hoity-toity way of speaking just doesn't go over well with me. I prefer the comedies. And this time around, I'm talking about A Bit of Fry and Laurie. It starred Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie in a comedy program that featured sketches with satire, wordplay, and innuendo. The bits were wrapped by people on the street interviews of the actors in various costumes, including drag. So be careful. Watching these clips in Florida might be illegal. There were a few recurring characters, including Tony, John, and Peter, but the highlight, in my opinion, would be the parody songs. Hugh Laurie was born in Blackbird Lays. His father was the winner of a gold medal in rowing at the 1948 Summer Olympics in London. Hugh followed in his footsteps and competed as a rower, but after a bout of glandular fever, he turned his focus to acting. Stephen Fry was born in Hampstead and grew up in Norfolk. Even though he was highly intelligent, he would be expelled from school as a teenager and spend three months in prison before resuming his education. The pair met while at Cambridge, and both were members of the Cambridge Footlights with Emma Thompson, who introduced them. In 1986, they would perform sketches for variety show Saturday Live, and soon after, the BBC commissioned a pilot episode for a bit of Fry and Laurie. It would be greenlit to a series in 1989. They performed in Black Adder, alongside Rowan Atkinson, and star in an adaptation of P.G. Woodhouse, Jeeves and Wooster. After a bit of Fry and Laurie wrapped in 1995, Hugh would appear in Sense and Sensibility with Emma Thompson, his former girlfriend and Footlights castmate. Even though Stephen Fry was not directly involved, the script that Emma had written became corrupted, so she brought her computer over to Stephen's house, and after seven hours, he was able to recover the screenplay. She would later win an Academy Award for it. Both have gone on to have successful careers, Hugh Laurie in House MD, and Stephen Fry as the host of QI for 13 seasons. They continue to remain the closest of friends, having thanked each other at various award shows over the years, referring to each other as my colleague. Stephen Fry was best man at Hugh's wedding, and is godfather to his three children. A Bit of Fry and Laurie aired for four seasons, 26 episodes, from 1989 to 1995. In 2010, the duo reunited for a retrospective, entitled Fry and Laurie Revisited. I've selected a couple of clips that truly encapsulate the show. They're all available in the Matt Watch That Playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about Billy Elliot, the movie and the musical. Directed by Stephen Daldry, who helmed The Hours, The Reader, and Trash. It was written by Lee Hall, who also scribed War Horse, Rocket Man, and Cats. It was based on his stage play. It tells the story of Billy Elliot, an 11-year-old boy from a working-class mining family in County Durham, England, who shows an interest and talent in ballet dancing. It's an inspiring story about subverting the expectations of your family and following your dreams. It stars Jamie Bell as Billy Elliot and Julie Walters as Miss Wilkinson, his ballet teacher. They deliver such strong performances, and their relationship is complicated. It's loving, it's harsh, she acts as a surrogate mother, guidance counselor, and friend. It also features Gary Lewis, Jamie Draven, Gene Haywood, and Stuart Wells. The film earned three Oscar nominations at the 2001 Academy Awards for Best Writing, Screenplay Written Directly for the Screen, Best Actress in a Supporting Role, and Best Director. It was adapted into a musical with songs written by Elton John and Lee Hall, debuting on the West End in 2005. It would move to Broadway three years later. Two notable stars who portrayed the titular character include Tom Holland from Spider-Man and Dean Charles Chapman of Game of Thrones and 1917 fame. Now, I had the cast recording, and I have to be honest, I wasn't impressed by listening to it. I felt the lyrics to be a bit amateurish, and many were taken from dialogue in the movie. It's almost as if he was too precious about his own words to the detriment of the actual songs. None of the music was particularly catchy. 
It's not like other shows like Wicked or Waitress or Grease, where you can listen to it out of context and enjoy it. It actually put me off to seeing the Broadway production, which I now regret. Years later, the musical was filmed and I was able to watch it from the enjoyment of my home, and without having to pay $200 a ticket. While my criticisms of the cast recording still stand, when you watch it within the context of the show, it's so much more entertaining, and in places, makes more sense, obviously. The musical features Elliot Hanna in the title role, alongside Ruthie Henschel, Decca Walmsley, Chris Gramson, Zach Atkinson, and Anne Emery, who originated the role of Grandma. My favorite numbers are Solidarity, Express Yourself, and The Letter. So if you get a chance, watch both of them, the movie and the musical. They're both available for streaming. That's all for this edition of Matt Watch That. Thanks for listening to me babble. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed, or suggestions as to what movie or TV pilot I should see, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Head over to MattSarosky.com for the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the reviews, rants, and randomness. It was edited by John Gypsum. Jims, Jims, Gypsum, Jimson, Gypsum. Yeah. A hard day's night starts with John Paul Jort. A hard day's nart. A hard day's nart. It sounds like I've had a hard day's night. The people were wrapped. The bits. The people were wrapped. With songs by Elton John and Lee Mack. Lee Mack? That would be a completely different musical. <laughs> <laughs>